Hello, everybody. My name is Ivan, as some of you already know. Uh, this is the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting Friday Forecasting Talks. And today we will have uh, an interesting view on the problem of business forecasting as a whole from Simon. So, uh, Simon, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining today's talk. and. Uh, thanks to Ivan and everyone else at the Centre of uh, Marketing Analytics and Forecasting for arranging this uh, series of talks. I found the other ones very interesting. Um, so today I'm going to give a, a talk. This is the first time I've given this talk. I want to cover sort of three um, very high level uh, aspects of business forecasting and how they kind of relate with each other. So first I'll just uh, introduce myself. Um, as I said before, my name is Simon Spavound. I'm a data science team lead at Peak. Uh, previously, I had a brief uh, stint as an academic, uh, mainly focused on teaching econometrics and data analytics. Uh, prior to that, I completed a PhD at Lancaster University Economics Department. Um, my main interest has always been uh, time series econometrics. Um, at work now, I mainly work on on demand type problems uh, for a lot of our industrial clients. Um, this is primarily consisted of uh, forecasting and optimization problems. Um, so the clients I've worked with have included a market leading concrete manufacturer, a global retail brand and, and several others. And this picture on the right is what I used to look like uh, before COVID and uh, haven't been able to have a haircut. Uh, for about six months, so apologies for that. Um, just a brief word about Peak. Um, we're a startup, an equity back, back startup. Uh, we use um, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to help companies make better decisions. Um, we have a lot of interesting clients and we do lots of interesting stuff. Um, but I'm going to put us into a little bit more context to make sure my talk is correctly placed into the context that I mean it. So what are you here to listen to me talk about? So many of uh, you in the audience will be involved in forecasting in, in some way or another. I had a quick look on the uh, LinkedIn post of, of kind of what uh, kind of people were um, inviting themselves to this event. Um, could be research, maybe practice or even some students looking to get into the field or uh, data scientists who are involved in in forecasting type problems. Um, one thing I've noticed, uh, particularly now that I do a lot of hiring in this area, is the many people who want to get into forecasting focus purely on minimizing some measure of accuracy. I should have put some minimizing some measure of error there. And the main theme of my talk is that Accuracy is, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. OK, and so this talk is going to discuss a few things I've come to realize about how companies and individuals should be deploying um, decision making systems using a, a slightly broader set of criterion. And so hence the title for this talk is Accuracy, Trust and Explainability, the Trinity for Business Forecasting. And I leave a question mark there because I think this is still an open open question. I'm very interested to hear uh, any feedback uh, from any of you uh, on what you think of this idea. So let's start with the putting ourselves into a bit of context. So running modern businesses uh, means that we need to satisfy some demand today. OK, and satisfying our demand today means that we have to take a lot of decisions. OK, so um, if we want to, to make some products, we need to, to process um, our inputs. We need to work out how many employees we need, how many machines and, and plant and capital we need, uh, what components we might need, other resources. OK, and all of these have different sort of lead times, and uh, different issues with each of them. OK, and this requires processes in planning a long time in advance. OK, and to put peak into context, we're helping businesses to make decisions or better decisions because within this uh, modern company, there are probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of decisions to be made 
uh, every single day for that company to achieve its success, whatever its success may be, whether that's uh, maximizing its profit, reducing its environmental footprint, all of these uh, things involve decisions and most of them involve some some aspect of, of thinking about the future. OK. So what do we do? We've deployed various types of machine learning systems to help businesses make better decisions. OK, so for a lot of the talks I've watched previously in this series, I've talked about um, demand planning. Um, we've also done uh, lots of stuff in that area. So production planning, logistics, um, warehouse operations. Um, and then we've done a, a load of other things in a, a more customer focused outputs where customer focused outputs could be other kinds of machine learning systems based on um, recommenders, similar to how Netflix decides what to, to recommend you to, to watch next or Amazon might recommend what else you should put in your basket. OK, so we've done this kind of uh, things as well. And we've deployed different types of machine learning solutions to help companies make better decisions for each of these uh, different problems. OK, so I want to have a look at uh, forecasting systems in particular, and I should probably start by saying what what am I talking about when I'm talking about a forecasting system? OK. So I'm going to take quite a broad uh, definition of forecasting um, because we want to ensure success. Um, so forecasting systems that I'm discussing here are not necessarily the technology which is employed. So that could be everything from a, an, a simple Excel spreadsheet up through to a uh, multi-million pound uh, enterprise resource planning system like many large enterprises deploy. Um, nor is it necessarily the statistical or the machine learning technique which I'm sort of discussing here either. OK. Uh, forecasting system, I'm going to use the definition of it, is, is more expansive. So it's going to include uh, the people, uh, the process. So that's the people, sorry, that's the people who are involved in in making the forecasts. That's the people who are involved in consuming those forecasts, um, the process by which those people first make the forecast and then use them. And then all the way through to crucially for me, the decisions that are being made uh, after that um, forecast has been made. OK, so crucially here you'll notice that forecasting is, is just a form of insight about what we think is going to happen in the future. And it's upon that insight that businesses make uh, make decisions. OK, and I'll, I'll just note here that I'm not really thinking about um, for the rest of this talk, I'm not really thinking about either companies which don't have any forecasting um, system and use purely sort of judgmental based um, forecasting and nor am I talking about uh, someone like uh, Uber or uh, or Amazon who are very sophisticated uh, you know bespoke sort of forecasting system I'm very much talking about the the standard enterprise of which there are tens of thousands uh, on the planet so what's the status quo okay I would say that most uh, if not all major companies have some forecasting capability deployed right now. Uh, I tried to find a stat on this and I know Robert's on the call. He might be able to help us with that one. I don't know uh, what the exact stat is off the top of my head, but uh, most large enterprises seem to have some form of cap uh, capability in, in this area. And the question really is what is stopping companies being um, effective and making the most out of their existing uh, forecasting systems and that's what I really want to to continue to delve into and the first thing that um, always gets thrown around is is difficulties with forecasting accuracy so I want to first start talking about what's what's going on with forecasting accuracy in these systems so let's see how businesses are actually using their forecasts to start with okay so as I alluded to before uh, Businesses are very complicated now, and so they require multiple forecasts in multiple areas. And these are just some examples I've kind of made up about how a single enterprise might be using forecasting. 
And this causes problems uh, in itself. OK, so we already know that if multiple forecasts are required and they're at different uh, granularities or different horizons, that they can be contradictory and um, uh, contradictory advice and, and difficulties of internal uh, business um, sort of harmony. Um, so, you know, companies need some sales forecasts, production forecasts, allocation forecasts, uh, logistics ones, accounts, my, all of these different uh, components of businesses are, are using forecasts. And each of these separate operational units may have a different forecasting system. Again, this could be the technology, the people and the process, OK? Um, to help each of these varying decisions that they're trying to make. Uh, operational confusion, I'd say, makes operating their forecast systems as a whole more difficult. So this is the classic uh, left hand uh, not talking to the right hand. Um, also, we, we often encounter that businesses operate as silos. So uh, information sharing between business operation units is often difficult. Uh, the classic example is um, the marketing team not sharing um, the expected promotion dates with the production team. OK, and because promotions massively impact how many sales is going to be and thus how much we need to produce, if we can't effectively share that information between the different units, um, we're going to have a hard time making uh, good decisions. And so the overall outcome of this uh, status quo leads business decision makers essentially yearning for more accurate systems, thinking that this is the, the outcome that they really need. And this often leads to a, a kind of strange situation where businesses are are asking essentially for just almost impossible to deliver forecasting. OK, and it's kind of missing the point in some respect. So, you know, they're asking this this magical forecasting system to tell them, you know, multiple years ahead, at a very high level of granularity, exactly what's going to happen. And this is the one thing that probably won't won't help. OK. Um, so there are improved technical approaches um, here which can help and um, Nikos uh, Karensis, who, who presented a, a previous in this session, has discussed uh, hierarchical methods and, and cross cross temporal hierarchies to allow uh, different forecasts to be reconciled within businesses and external to businesses. And all these things can and should be deployed to help businesses uh, improve their, their decision making capability. OK, so nothing I'm about to say is is going to take away from uh, trying to apply the most accurate methodology that we should. OK, but we still see that some businesses who are deploying state of the art forecasting systems are not happy uh, or they're not satisfied with the results or they're not getting uh, good results. And, and, the, and the question is why? And I think this is where some learnings from deploying uh, machine learning uh, systems, decision systems, I think we can offer some interesting perspective on this problem. So accuracy is the elephant in the room here. OK, so accuracy is the thing that everyone craves for. It's the it's the easiest and, and perhaps the most convenient thing to measure. Um, it can be converted into some business metric more or less easily, okay, depending on exactly what we're trying to do. Um, however, we must be aware of not falling into sort of the the McNamara fallacy of what we the only thing we can measure is the only thing we care about. OK, and the astute amongst you will see that I have uh, explainability and trust just peeping out uh, just behind my my giant accuracy, which seems to be all everyone cares about. And this is, uh, you know, every every business cares about how accurate the system is. Uh, very few businesses are saying, you know, how can I trust the system or or some are increasingly starting to ask about how explainable systems are. Um, so it's these other two things I want to to start to focus on now. So sorry, before I start talking about trust and explainability, I want to talk a little bit about what, uh, in my experience, causes mistrust uh, with 
these systems. And mistrust is kind of formed in in a few different ways. Um, you can create a huge amount of mistrust from answering the wrong question in the first place. So if the in the forecasting context, if you're providing uh, forecasts at the wrong level of granularity or uh, the the incorrect horizon or or any of these kind of simple things, they, they cause much confusion and, and and just don't help. You know, if, they, if you're not helping the user to uh, improve their decision making process, they're not going to use your system or trust your system. Uh, the second one I want to, to raise um, is what's called broken leg cues. So this is ones where obviously to the um, to the user, the forecast is wrong. OK, this may not be obvious to us as as external people or, or even forecasters who are internal to companies who are who are not necessarily have the same level of domain knowledge, but these things are very difficult and cause uh, lots of issues. So um, any time when this it is normally indicative of a lack of domain knowledge and not understanding the, the problem well enough um, or not, let's say it not appreciating that there are some issues that we don't necessarily uh, fully understand. Um, the third one I want to, to raise is black box solutions. So this is where we might deploy uh, a system without having any visibility on on what it's doing, i.e. So we just throw some inputs at it and it just spits out some outcomes. You know, we've just deployed it and left it for our user to try and figure out what's going on. Um, this often comes up in the in the context of of machine learning uh, solutions. And the final one is is kind of questions around individual SKUs. So, you know, um, in a lot of companies now, we might be forecasting for tens of thousands of SKUs, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of SKUs. Um, and we might be optimizing over some some error metric across all of the SKUs. And there'll always be something in there that, that doesn't work well. And, um, you know, when you're showing your users the the results and you're saying you know I have this MAPE or this you know this other error metric which is amazing they uh, they immediately pick out some some particular skew that they know about and they immediately show you how wrong you are and so all of these things start to to cause some um, mistrust and um, yeah uh, in the system as a whole and so why is why is that so important because lack of trust in a a system can manifest itself in multiple different ways. Um, the worst of which is is non acceptance. So the users just don't use it and it um, becomes a total failure. OK, and anecdotally, I believe this is one of the, the reasons that machine learning systems in general have been seen as as overhyped or, or prone to failure is because they haven't got the necessary trust from the from whoever's had the system deployed to to start using it and have some some real impact and and sort of utility to them. Um, and obviously total failure is a bad is a bad outcome. It costs uh, businesses a lot of money to deploy these systems. They're, they're throwing a lot of resource at, at forecasting systems. So if you if people aren't using it or if it isn't helping to make decisions, this is um, very yeah, it's a very bad outcome, let's say. Um, these things all apply to to machine learning systems in general, but I also want to to bring some of that learning back to uh, forecasting systems in particular. Um, as I've seen many companies who want help with their forecasting and they want some sort of um, machine learning approach to help them. And I see some other things that lack of trust seems to manifest itself in. Um, I think one of the, the key things is this Billy Wilder quote I'd like to assign to, to users of forecasting systems. So trust your own instinct. Your mistakes might be as well be your own instead of someone else's. OK, so what happens is, and uh, well, this is what I've seen at least recently, is um, if, if there's no trust in the forecasting system, it encourages people to make many, many uh, adjustments in their forecasting systems. OK, and I think this is what I kind of hypothesize. You know, we see in the literature, there's a lot of discussion around uh, the benefits of judgmental adjustments. And I've seen this uh, firsthand that users end up not trusting a system. So they start making judgmental adjustments all over the all over the show. And 
Uh, even worse, they start to fall back on more rudimentary uh, forecasting approaches and start overwriting um, the the recommendations that are given to them, and they fall back to you know naive um, naive methods essentially uh, a lot of the time. And these judgmental adjustments as well can paradoxically be made even worse if there's no trust between different silos within a single organization. Um, so if uh, different business units don't trust each other potentially due to, to conflicting goals. Um, again, the classic example being uh, sales guys promising that they'll sell hundreds of thousands of units, production guys looking at that forecast and saying, no chance, I'm going to underproduce because I just don't believe that forecast. And so the whole system starts to break down and doesn't provide the, the utility that it's supposed to. Um, and so bad overall system design, so including those uh, key performance indicators can make things much worse. Uh, the worst one there as well in the in the KPIs is I often see um, firms where they give demand planners the ability to, to overwrite past forecasts. And so when they're targeted on forecast accuracy, they systematically go back through time, adjusting the forecasts to match reality so that they have a very good looking forecasts, but they're completely useless in terms of evaluating historic forecast performance or or trying to make better decisions in the future and, and making some learnings off of what their adjustments were. Um, I don't think Billy Wilder, who if people don't know, he was a, a director in in the golden age of Hollywood. I don't think he'd ever expect to be in a forecasting uh, presentation, but but there you go. Um, so the other thing that I mentioned in my my troika uh, was explainability. And again, I just want to, to place what I mean by explainability in this context into a, a broader kind of uh, idea. So um, always one for a bit of a pithy phrase, but uh, like beauty, I think explainability is in the eye of the beholder. OK, so. I'm not trying to say here there's a there's been a big move for towards um, explainable AI as a specific sub subgroup of, of uh, machine learning. Uh, it's not what I'm talking about. Um, I mean, in in some cases, even a, a simple moving average can have as many explainability issues as a neural network if we don't uh, correctly um, demonstrate to the user value in, in what we're doing or what we're trying to achieve. OK, so explainability can be you know can be as simple as just demonstrating how the system works and crucially understanding where it does not okay because we may know there are some some skews that we're not good at forecasting you know um, certain types of skews often cause problems um, you know cold start forecasting and, and whatnot and mitigating all of those issues as much as possible okay and what does this form of explainability crucially help with is trust okay by going on that sort of journey with with our user of the forecast and, and understanding their problems we we build up the trust that means that the previous issues of mistrust are less likely to manifest and therefore there's more likely to be success in the in the outcome of the of the whole system okay which as people who are implementing these forecasting systems is what we fundamentally care about um so what can help uh, here, this is a very difficult one. I could I could do an entire session just on on explainability, both in in the explainable AI context and as a as a more general uh, feel. Uh, but for anyone who's who's looking at getting into to forecasting and stuff, you must be prepared that your users will have many many questions, and there'll be lots of sort of why questions. Okay, and so. The overall goal here is not necessary to to have to explain, you know, exponential smoothing or a REMA to our to our clients or you know gradient boosting or anything like that, but to to get user acceptance and empowering that user to make better data driven decisions because that's the overall goal here. It's not for them to to be able to sort of power back the underlying statistics, but just for them to have enough faith that you know you've done your homework okay yeah i could do a whole session on on explainability in this sort of broader broader context but time is uh, quite precious um and so this is 
leads to what I think is an explainability accuracy trust cycle. So with a correct understanding of the business context, what data scientists now know is domain knowledge, uh, which is often uh, thrown around there as, as something we need to, to, to have for building models is, is domain knowledge. That um, understanding of the business context leads to a more informed model build. And the more informed the model build is, the more accurate the results playback is to the users and to the, the people who've, you know, ask for the system to be implemented. That results playback allows, provides explanations to allow to the users and allow ref further refinement. And through that process of continuous refinement, this allows more trust due to an increased understanding of the business context. Okay, and so it's kind of a cyclical um, idea of as we develop models, you know, we're now building more and more sort of dynamic systems. Um, that need this kind of philosophy underlying them to help um, ensure success. OK. Um, so yeah, this is this is my proposed trinity that they're all equally kind of important. Um, accuracy is I don't want to uh, leave the, the mistaken impression that accuracy is not important. Accuracy is, is kind of a precondition of everything I've talked about, um, but it's as we know from machine learning, they can often be more accurate, but if, if no one wants to, to use those systems, that accuracy is, is completely moot. And so having, um, you know, for, for anyone who's implementing these kind of systems designs, having these three things at some level in the um, design idea, I think could be a very powerful kind of set of tools, okay, rather than solely focusing on accuracy. Um, which could lead to, to not great outcomes for the business. So I'll just offer a few uh, concluding remarks before I um, pass back to Ivan for any questions. A um, few things. Implementation of successful forecasting and decision systems is, is hard. OK, and I put the stress on the successful part. OK, so making it so it's well used, you know, that that businesses want to use it and they're getting good outcomes is, is difficult. Um, an excessive focus on accuracy alone is a, you know, accuracy is a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, in my experience for overall success in making better decisions. OK, there's no point trying to deploy a, a non-accurate system, um, but by itself that doesn't mean you're going to have success because if systems are not adopted then the accuracy that you're sort of trying to put into practice just is purely theoretical okay and so my sort of suggestion is that more consideration should be placed on on both explainability and trust um, in automated decision making capabilities within the business okay so that's the the end of my uh, talk thank you for listening um, if anyone on the call is is interested um, I hope this didn't come across too salesy. Uh, Peak is hiring, um, so please uh, feel free to get in touch if um, you want to come and make uh, businesses do great things with data. And these are my details. Um, I'll send Ivan these slides, obviously, and, and anyone can feel free to get in touch. But thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that was quite interesting presentation. Uh, we have several questions already, and uh, if anyone wants to ask uh, some additional questions, please type them in the Q&A session, and I will uh, ask Simon to respond. So the first one, how do you go about quantifying the value added by machine learning methods? Uh, for example, beyond just simpler benchmarks like exponential smoothing. Yeah, I think this is a really good uh, question. Uh, thank you. Um, so. The key thing is is to to place the the benchmark has to be some sort of realistic uh, reflection of what's currently being done within a business process. So you know, looking and examining what uh, what is the actual outcome. You know, so if a if a firm is already using something more fancy than um, a random walk, there's no point using a random walk as your benchmark, right? So you have to quantify what's the the benefit uh, above and beyond. What they're currently already doing. Um, so I think that's um, that's the first thing. Um, placing value on 
on machine learning systems that they're providing is, is a difficult subtask, I think, within within this whole domain of trying to understand what is it that uh, quantifiably is is improving in the business because sometimes it's uh, straightforward to um, you know you can see that you've spent x hours less time making decisions because you've automated away some some part of the business process but uh, or you've reduced the amount of safety stock that you've had to carry because you've improved the the forecast accuracy um those are a relatively clear cut though not always um but yeah it's a it can be a difficult subdomain and does executive SNLP not have a role to play in making sure there is a flow of consistent forecasts downstream yeah that's a Again, I think there's this is my kind of question, uh, position about um, well-designed business systems. I think is the is the the, the crucial bit should be the well-designed um, system, and, and like like with a lot of what I'm saying, I use system in a more broad uh, term here. So um, making sure that you know individual business units are aligned for instance, is it should be a key part of that. Um, the problem is it's not well done in my experience. You know, these these systems are often deployed ad hoc. You know, um, it's very rare that um, entire businesses are put, being put onto whole systems. It has been done and it, you know, it can be very successful. Um, but that still seems to be the relative uh, rarity, I would say. Um, OK, thanks. The next question is from Robert. What technical tools are used to support explainability in the context of forecasting? Yeah, so this is where I think there is some uh, work still to be done. Uh, so we've developed a few things we can do. So one of the difficulties is particularly with uh, machine learning type outcome, the type uh, methods, as you know, Shapley values and, and these kind of uh, things are not necessarily interpretable let's put it that way so there's definitely room for more of those um kind of technical pieces um again there's there's other things that can be done here though in terms of making sure that um forecasts are aligning with the the outcome that the users are expecting um and yeah there's a variety of bits and pieces so i think there's a few there's a few bits we can do, but I think there's still further work in this area to uh, to be done. Um, yeah. OK, uh, could I could I make a point on that um, uh, to Robert as well uh, to you, Simon? Uh, first, it's not clear and this is back to your trinity of trust. What makes somebody trust a model? In fact, the, this is a live research area and in, in uh, related to the notion of people distrusting algorithms in general uh, under certain circumstances. And of course, we see examples of them just accepting them. Uh, witness the debacle over the, uh, uh, the algorithm grading A level and uh, GCSE grades last uh, summer. Um, but it's fairly clear uh, in the demand planning context, which is where I, I research that people don't accept the uh, algorithms, don't understand the models, don't trust the model. So you can say a model contains uh, a particular variable. It contains uh, promotional evidence in demand planning. Does that mean people believe it? Uh, Anna, of course, is researching this area. And in fact, they uh, they typically don't believe it enough, essentially. So there is an interesting uh, subsidiary question. If you take a simple model, which they can understand, fully explainable, um, and then make judgmental adjustments, which we know that, that some 70 or 80 percent in some situations, manufacturing anyway, they do do that. Uh, or do you take a complicated machine learning algorithm which nobody understands and then they make judgmental adjustments? How does that play out? And we've got a little evidence 
uh, which suggests that the machine learning plus judgment is better than the simple. But, uh, you, you know, it's very, very tentative work. So there are that, that issue of explainability and the trust you put in the explanation, which is perhaps a rather separate issue, uh, is really um, unknown and uh, part of the research agenda, really. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, uh, Robert. Yeah, your, your input is always uh, appreciated. Um, yeah, no, I think I completely agree. I think this was kind of a bit of the motivation to sort of discuss these uh, issues a bit more broadly um, because, yeah, it, this is why my current sort of feeling on this is, is to take that one step back and look at rather than focusing just on do they understand the algorithm, you know, like I don't think our goal should be, you know, if we're deploying um, these systems, like our goal shouldn't be for our users to be able to explain gradient boosting trees or something back to us. You know, this is not kind of what they they're wanting. Um, but there's clearly a. That's why I think that if we take a step, one step back and look at the the outcomes that it drives and make sure we're understanding fully or able to demonstrate fully that this. Uh, outcome that it's achieving is beneficial to them. I think that's where, uh, from my perspective at least, it's more likely to be successful in terms of uh, adoption. But yeah, I'm fully, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very happy you mentioned that it's a kind of ongoing research uh, effort and it's something I'd like to provoke more, uh, more discussion around because I think, um, particularly in the machine learning space, there's a lot of discussion around um, yeah, algorithms. Uh, it's very interesting which ones people seem to be happy to accept. Um, you know, on the on the school exams one, for instance, I, I thought that was an interesting example. So people don't seem very happy to to have the the teachers' grades adjusted by them. But there's already an algorithm algorithm used in the, in the loosest possible term that that already maps um, the grade students get on their paper to the to the actual grade they receive. But again, maybe that's awareness. Um, there's clearly different different levels of awareness of what's going on, but certainly um, quite often humans, we don't seem to like being uh, the idea that the machines are telling us what to what to do. Um, yeah. OK, thanks, uh, Robert, for your comment. Thanks, Simon, for responding. We have actually quite a lot of questions. So the next one is uh, from John. What strategies have you adopted to make forecasts uh, better explained? Yeah, uh, this is a good, um, good question. So this is a lot of this boils back to like where, at what level? Do you see what I mean? So this is why I wanted to to try and put that um, explainability in the in the eye of the beholder kind of comment, um, because for some users, uh, non-technical users, shall we say, like there's no no white boxing of the of the solution is ever going to help okay so um there are sort of you know strategies around providing value uh, demonstration through through a b testing you know this kind of thing of of, of demonstrating uh, exactly that you, you know how much better things would be if you followed this strategy and again that's why i think a lot of this then follows into the trust because then you you demonstrate the value and then the trust flows and then you make further improvements and so on so that's uh, probably slightly avoiding the question like a politician, but uh, yeah. OK, uh, Carlos has an interesting uh, idea. What about velocity? So the, summarizing his comment, you might need to construct a lot of forecasts for many products. Uh, is this one of the issues, one of the reasons why people don't uh, use more complicated methods? Could this be one of the dimensions? Yeah, no, I think this is this is a, a crucial point. You see, because um, uh, human human attention span is 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 naturally limited. Or let's say not attention span. That's a uh, human. The amount of time humans can be spending making these decisions is necessarily limited, and therefore they should be focusing on the most important uh, decisions. Essentially, that's kind of my philosophy in a, a lot of these that where we have human in the loop decision making systems, which most forecasting systems I think would fall into that kind of general sphere. Um, that's 
kind of it's important to minimize the number of specific um, uh, decisions users are having to make. Um, so velocity, maybe in terms of how often this needs to be redone, I'm guessing, and retraining and and this kind of thing. Yeah. So there's definitely a yeah. So sorry. There there is a another piece around trust I didn't bring up in this talk because it does throw in a more complicated question about if we provide in the simplest context, let's say I'm I'm forecasting for Ivan how many uh, attendees the the CMAF talk will get. If I do it every day for the following week. And it depends what decision Ivan's trying to make. But if I'm changing my number every single day, you know, one day I'm saying 20 people are going to attend, the next day 200 people, the following day 50. This for humans, uh, of which I classify myself as one, uh, don't find that particularly uh, helpful. And I think that kind of uh, reduces trust. So I think this is where like, You've got to understand like what is the context in which those hundreds of thousands of uh, forecasts are being made and at what point is the human involved because it's the humans who, sh who struggle with trust um, in, in the system. So in, in somebody is asking in your experience what are your advices to improve the trust in the forecast models so do you okay. have any thoughts suggestions? Yeah tr trust is it's that old adage of you know trust is earned um and with and with models and and so on that's as true as with anything else so providing performance it is the key one so that's that's why all of my talk here has has kind of been conditional on accuracy right so conditional on you having a model which can help right because there are you know you can build a, a model which doesn't help conditional on that you then have to move forward to the adoption stage and and trust and um comes in there and this is where um, demonstrating value you know and, and this can be quite difficult for, for forecasting because fundamentally you're always uh, except in trivial cases you're always wrong in terms of the um, traditional machine learning thing you know there's there's always you're, you're minimizing um, the error you're not eliminating it altogether so you're always somehow wrong and so it's just demonstrating compared to what already exists uh, that we're, we're making improvements we're making your life easier we're making your life better we're, we're achieving your kpis with less resource we're you know we're reducing the amount of waste and all you know demonstrating these things is is very powerful for um, engendering trust i think mm -hmm. uh, another quite related question uh, are there any key lessons you want to share from having worked with different companies so i work with companies in all kinds of different areas you have to be a bit careful with uh, with which uh companies we talk about um but there's there's two things i'll, I'll share is um firstly firms are it's a bit paradoxical actually firms are, are firstly more similar to each other than they first appear from the outside and then they're also more different than they appear from each other um, and so what do I mean by that? So each firm is, uh, you know, they have their own internal politics, they have their own internal systems, they have their own internal um, kind of uh, machinery, let's say, uh, but they also have, you know, the same sorts of goals. You know, fundamentally, most firms are, are trying to drive uh, KPIs, you know, profit, revenue, reduce waste, you know, reduce inputs, all these kind of things are all kind of similar. So um, lots. So, so my key insight is, is if you're if you're doing this kind of thing is learn to understand how businesses work in general so that you can quickly apply your understanding to any new new situation you come across. Do you have a measure or of risk included in the forecast? I guess we can rephrase it slightly. So in practice, when you have to deal with uncertainty, how do you uh, <laughs> how do you handle it, especially for the clients? You know? Yeah, so essentially you have to kind of embrace the uncertainty, which is quite scary, right? Like you, you kind of have to admit, I think the fun of doing forecasting for me is is knowing that, you know, I say fun, maybe it's the stress. I don't know, maybe I'm I'm going grey because of it. Um the the fun is kind of knowing that you're you're gonna be wrong in some respects and you're trying to reduce the the level of 
of being wrong essentially you know things come along and surprises right like if anyone was selling a uh you know if anyone was, was had a forecasting system that could deal with the, you know the covid-19 pandemic in uh 2018 i struggle to to believe that right so we're constantly uncovering this so there's distinctly an, an area here of um helping businesses and this is why I see the, the usefulness of forecasting systems. It's helping businesses deal with that uncertainty, given that we live in an uncertain world. And it seems to be a cliche to say that the world is becoming more and more uncertain. I'm not necessarily convinced that's true. Um, the, the key thing here is to go on a, a journey with the clients of, of and, you know, in all systems of, of understanding what is the outcome that they're trying to achieve and how can we help them to achieve it, um, basically. Mm -hmm. Right, so now we have uh, questions of uh, Anna. The first one regarding this Trinity, should it be a partial part of design or forecast support system rather than just part of a uh, process? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think so. I think so. I think that it's kind of like that whole um so one of the things we do at peak is we, we take a very sort of user centric approach to to building these systems so rather than deploying it onto our users it's it's we're we're trying to help them right we're 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 partnering with our customers essentially so um that's a very powerful thing um of understanding what is the what is it that's going to drive the most value for our uh, customers. So I think, yeah, I think it has to be um, integral, right? So you'll notice in, in this, I've, I've, I've said very high level in all these things and tried to take one step back because I think that's the most useful way to see a lot of these things um, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. A related question, is there a trade-off between accuracy, trust and explainability? I think there's definitely, I think the trust one, as Robert said, is a open, question slightly i think i've purposely avoided trying to define exactly what causes people to trust systems i think uh <clears throat> understanding why people trust each other is is can be difficult enough um so i kind of want to take one slight sidestep from that one i think there's a clear uh a clear trade-off between a more let's say a more clear trade-off between accuracy and explainability uh, just because um, many many times uh, accuracy is related to complexity okay so although i use the sort of contrived example of like maybe a simple moving average is uh, has explainability issues it's likely to have less explainability issues right so um, something more complicated is likely to have more uh, explainability issues now, if you're delivering results, I think a lot of those things go away uh, as an aside, right? So if you deploy a very, you know, if I could build uh, something that um, told Devan exactly how many people were going to come to his his uh, this CMAF webinar, I don't think he would mind how I did it as long as I was consistently providing um, results. But I don't think we live in that world, right? That's the key. I don't think we live in a world where it's except in trivial cases it's it's possible to do that so um yeah okay another question uh, anonymous says that one of the issues they see in the system is that uh, systems are not co-developed with the users there are some models uh, which are estimated somehow using different losses so uh, do you have any views uh, from as a graduate econometrician to someone who works with reality. Yeah, I think that's I think that's crucial. I think that's a crucial aspect, right? Like um, again, very similar to 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 Robert's point about um, top down implementation of algorithms on us. You know, I think it's a, it's the same issue, right? If if uh, if we're forced to use some sort of system that's not, you know, that's potentially replacing us or you know, uh, supposed to be helping us, but appears to make our lives much harder. Um, that's that's key. And at the end of the day, um, there's about 10 million blog posts that say data scientists should um, get some domain knowledge. 
this is our domain knowledge for, for, for data scientists who are entering uh, this field. The domain knowledge is what these users know about the system that we don't know about. OK, um, so you have to be a little bit humble in some respects of, of acknowledging um, what you don't don't yet understand and using that to inform the model building process. And uh, that's why I put this cycle, because like, I think the it's not always guaranteed that's going to go 100% correct the first time. Um, but that co-development can be a very powerful, um, a very powerful uh, kind of uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last question that we have in the chat is by Jonathan. Uh, is the explainability an issue with the algorithm or actually the data? Because there are some events or drivers outside of our data that could be not taken into account by the systems and models. Definitely. So I think the best example of this is a counter example. I don't think anyone who was using systems, let's say, I forget the exact date, around March 29th of last year when uh, lockdown happened, I don't think there'd be many people who were surprised that suddenly their forecast didn't look quite accurate anymore. Right? So they trusted that. They trusted that it would be wrong, which is the perhaps the wrong kind of trust, but at least it was an understanding that this is not included, right? The question there is, why did the system not include? If the system is including everything that it should, um, then we have none of these issues. Clearly, there's going to be problems where we can't include every possible eventuality, but we should be aiming to include every salient uh, feature. So, um, yeah, I think often the, the answers are in the in the users uh, heads somehow in terms of how they think the system works at least um and often this is this is kind of you know we're, we're going beyond time series forecasting into sort of the more general um you know incorporating of, of all available information um to just to make our system as successful as possible mm -hmm. Right, thanks a lot. Uh, the very last question, we are running out of time. So Dimitris has asked, uh, do you think that the use of point forecasts in a solution can reduce the trust in forecasts? Uh, what if we used or convinced users to use prediction intervals to sort of understand the uncertainty? Would that help? Yeah, this is a great question, uh, Dimitris. Thank you very much. Uh, so this one, I spent a bit of time thinking about because I think because uh, I think if I'm read between the lines, the the problem uh, Demetrius is identifying is that point forecasts provide uh, inflated sense of certainty about the future. Um, and so if we provide confidence intervals or probabilistic forecasts that provide some some measure, perhaps that will help. The issue there is we're then adding another layer of explainability on top. OK, that's the only issue with with that. I'm I'm all aboard uh, doing uh, probabilistic type forecasts where we're we're doing uh, densities and, and intervals and things. But I think there's a crucial um, issue here of providing those to users without explaining what's actually going on uh, can lead to difficult to difficult outcomes. But that is a, a very good question. Um, thank you. Right, thanks a lot everybody. Um, this is it for today. We will share Simon's slides and the video online. We will also share his coordinates if you want to get in touch with him. So join us, our uh, meetup group or join our LinkedIn. Uh, and Stay tuned. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you Simon for presenting and see you all in two weeks. Bye bye.